Good morning, church. It's a joy to meet you again through this online service on this Sunday morning. I believe we are all waiting enthusiastically to worship the Lord this Sunday morning. So let us quieten our hearts and come before the Lord with an expectant heart. Please respond to the call to worship. God made the world and everyone in it. Our life and breath come from God. God made all nations under heaven. We are all God's offspring. Search for God in our time of worship. When we search, we find God near. The choir will lead us in introit hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let us unite our hearts as we say this opening prayer together. Hear our prayers, O God, as we come to sing your praises. Bless us with your steadfast love in times of peace and in times of trial. Make your presence known to us this day, for we seek to know you better. Enliven us with your spirit of truth and increase our faith even as we place our hope and trust in you. Amen. Let us rejoice in the Lord's goodness and put our voices together to sing the opening hymn, Jesus Shall Reign. Psalter reading is taken from Psalm 66, verses 8 to 20. Please respond accordingly. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our loins. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us forth to a spacious place. 
I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who worship God, and I will tell what God has done for me. I cried aloud to God, who was highly praised with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened and has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Choir will lead us in the prayer hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Let us come to the Lord in the quietness of our heart as we bow our heads and lift up our hearts in prayer. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed in, with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment stretching out the heavens like a tent. Heavenly Father, we rejoice together with the psalmist as we bless your holy name and give glory to you, our creator of heaven and earth. We come before you with our hearts fully surrendered to you this morning once again. As we come together as a church, we rejoice in your holy name. We lift up your mighty and beautiful and powerful name because there's only one name that we can lift up and worship. And that is you and you alone. Oh Father, we come to you with our hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving. What can we bring before you, Lord, but praise and thanksgiving, glorifying you and you alone. And we come mindful of our own sinful nature. As the psalmist says, O Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Yes, Lord, even as we come praising and glorifying your holy name, we are mindful of our own sinful nature. We come confessing our sins, seeking your forgiveness. You know our hearts, you know our thoughts, you know our deeds, you know our lives, O oh Father. O oh Lord, we come seeking to repent from our ways that does not honor you. For we hear again and again through your word, your invitation to repent and to come into your kingdom. We thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. 
We thank you, Lord, that you cleanse us. You purify our hearts and our minds. You remove the guilt and sin away from our lives. The old has gone, the new has come. You give us an opportunity to come and renew our walk with you. We thank you and praise you for the forgiveness of sins. We come before you with our hearts full of thanksgiving. We look at the past week, the weeks as that has gone by, the months and the years. We are thankful for everything that we received from you. We thank you for those who are celebrating their birthdays as we reflect upon the years that has passed. We thank you for those who are celebrating their weddings anniversaries, for the life that you have bestowed upon them in marriage. We thank you for our families. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, your protection, your providence, your promises that you have fulfilled in our lives. Oh God, again and again, we are reminded of your word which says, He who has called you is faithful and bring it to completion. And we see that in our lives every day. And so we come with thanksgiving in our hearts. For the very little things to the great things that you do in our lives. For every gift, every goodness, and every challenges that we face, we know that you are with us in and through it. And you take us through that journey. And as we look back into our lives, we can only come and say, Thank you, Lord, for you have brought us thus far. You have provided for us. And you have protected us. We thank you for your healing. For those who are unwell and struggling with the weakness of these bodily ailments. We know that strength comes from you. Healing comes from you. For your word says, I am the Lord who healeth you. We thank you, Lord, for troubled lives which have found comfort in you. For your word brings peace, joy, and strength in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for those who are going through difficult times and continue to put our trust and hope in you. You know our hearts. You know for those of us who are seated right here in front of you. And so we give you thanks, for we know, Lord, that you are with us in every moment of our lives. We come before you, Lord, this morning also to give you thanks and bring before you our supplication. We remember our community that's around us. We know that due to this COVID-19, we all face the challenges together with our community. And we thank you for your hand that is upon our nation. Thank you for leading and guiding our leaders. We thank you for all the frontline workers. We thank you for everyone who's doing, doing their part. We thank you, Lord, for providing for all our needs so that we can overcome this challenge that's before us. And we know, Lord, that you will continue to guide us so that you will give us a way out of these troubled times. But we wait patiently, Lord, for we know that you are in control. And so we uphold the whole nation and the challenges that's before us and ask, O oh God, that your hand will continue to guide all those who are in authority who are making no decisions. Help those who are out in the field working so that all these measures that are put forward can be followed accordingly. We thank you for every citizen, O Lord, that works in obedience so that we can bring about a community that loves and cares for one another. We thank you, Lord, for the changes that may come after this. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to prepare us. We ask, O oh God, that your hands will also continue to guide us to take these changes in the right spirit and continue to open our hearts and our ears to listen to your voice so that we may do what is right before you, Lord. Even as a church, as we come before you, we are mindful of the changes that may come before us. And we ask, O oh God, that you give us wisdom and you guide us 
so that we may be faithful community that continues to serve you, Lord, in the midst of the changes. We pray and ask, O oh God, that our families, young and old, marriages, family bondings, struggles within and without, the changes that brings, the changes that comes into our day-to-day -day lives, we pray and ask, O oh God, that you will equip us, that you will speak through your word, through your servants, through our fellow brothers and sisters, that each one of us will continue to sharpen our ears to hear your voice as we walk day by day closely in your presence. We ask, O oh God, that even as a church, our ministries that's before us, to serve those who are weak, those who are helpless, those who are lonely in the society, to continue to teach, to preach, to continue to touch lives, to continue to reach out and bring the story of salvation, the good news, to near and far, through evangelism, through missions, through social concerns. We ask that you open our minds, open our eyes, open our hearts, that we may be faithful servants in the body of Christ. So to that end, we surrender ourselves this morning and ask, O Holy Spirit of God, that you will lead us. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we prepare ourselves to give our offerings and our tithes to God. As we have already encouraged you, the various methods to give, please uh, be reminded that if you are unable to do so, to set aside your giving so that when we meet together, you can bring them to the church. At this time, we'll sing, Take Time to Be Holy. Thank you. 
reading this morning is taken from 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verses 11 to 14. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's message is titled, What Went Wrong? The message will be delivered to us by Reverend Dr. Babu Emmanuel. Greetings, everyone. It's very good to see you all. I hope you are very well, safe and strong. Please continue to take good care of yourself. Keep well, safe and strong. Take care of yourself, each other, and everyone around you. <coughs> As always, it's a wonderful thing to come together to, to meditate on the Word. Today, we have a very interesting and an important topic which comes to us in the form of a question, what went wrong? We will meditate on this question or reflect on this question based on the text that was read to us, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 11 to 14. <coughs> What was wrong, or what went wrong, can be raised almost in any field or any aspect of life. For instance, in the area of politics, particularly after a general election, if a party happens to lose the election, perhaps the party will meet together after the election and deliberate what went wrong. In the area of sports as well, for instance, if a team or if a country loses a match, cricket match, they may sit and deliberate on the question, what went wrong? Where could we have done right? Or did we go wrong? Or where we went wrong? In the area of science as well, if, uh, for instance, uh, a space mission fails, scientists will certainly meet together and discuss the question, what went wrong? Or where did we go wrong? in the area of business, or in the area of medical experiments, in the area of war, and even in the area of relationships, broken relationships, divorces, what went wrong? Why didn't the relationship succeed or, or, or continue? So the question, what went wrong, can be raised in any aspect of life. <clears throat> also, this question seems to be one that is asked normally in retrospection. We have come certain distance in whatever area, we can sort of look back and ask what went wrong. Even though when we started the journey, we may not have anticipated that something would go wrong, but something had inevitably gone wrong and we are shrewd and astute enough to sense that something has gone wrong and therefore we can look back 
and ask what went wrong. My question certainly would be, is it necessary that something should go wrong at all? Or is it necessary at all that we must raise this question, what went wrong? We will look at these questions as we, as we continue to reflect on the passage that was read to us. I would like to share with you, based on the text that was read to us, four thoughts very briefly. <clears throat> First of all, consider with me the idea of ignorance. The idea of ignorance. It is said of Zedekiah in verse 12, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 13, he became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord. He became more and more unfaithful. He followed the detestable practices of the nations, verse 14, and defiled the temple of the Lord. What's the connection between these verses and the idea that I'm sharing with you, the idea of ignorance? Zedekiah was the king of the nation Judah. And they had the temple of the Lord. You had the festivals. You had the special days. You had the regular times of prayer every day. And you had the daily sacrifices. So life sort of revolved around the temple and all of life, all of temple activities. He had religion, a live, thriving religion. But he didn't know his God. He was very busy with his religion. The entire nation was busy with the religion. They had the festivals, as I said. Everything that would make this religion an attractive one. As if they were very close to the Lord because they had all kinds of activisms. Life centered on or around all kinds of religion-based or temple-centric activities. But he didn't know the Lord himself. He didn't know that even though they had a life and thriving religion, that God wasn't there. He didn't know who this God is and who this God is in relation to several aspects of life. First of all, all the prophets so far have emphasized the fact that the nation shouldn't be unfaithful to this God. So you have one God. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, you read, Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord, the God is one. So Zedekiah, being the king of Judah, should have asked this question, what is the connection between being faithful, what's the connection between this one God, having one God, monotheism, and being the king of this nation? What is the connection between being faithful to this one God and nation building? He didn't ask this question because he didn't know who this God is. So religion produces a sense, a vague sense of God. God is almost like a construct, an idol produced by religion. Whereas God is sort of above and beyond all our religious observances all our religious notions and definitions. Ignorance. Zedekiah should have asked, what is, or what are the practical implications of my religion? I am the king of the nation. So what does it mean to be the king of the nation and to be the ruler of this nation as a representative of God himself? What does it mean for this nation to follow this Lord? What does it mean for me to be a nation builder while being a faithful follower of this God? He didn't know what to do as a king. He didn't know how to rule the nation because he didn't know who this God is. He perhaps simply enjoyed the privilege of being the king of the nation. He was born into it. He was born into that privilege, 
but he wasn't a thinker. We'll come to it. So ignorance, what went wrong is the question we are raising. First of all, the question or the point of ignorance. Secondly, illiteracy, I would say. This was the wrong that we can sense in the text that we read, illiteracy. <coughs> Zedekiah was a political illiterate, I would think. He didn't read. It's not that we say, we mean by being an illiterate that he couldn't read and write. Perhaps he did not read and write. But he didn't know to read his history. He didn't know to read and make sense of the history of the past history of his nation. Because this one particular criticism is, is raised against almost every king, except perhaps for David. Every king was criticized by the prophets. Such and such a king, or so and so, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So if Zedekiah was a political literate, he should have taken time to think and ask this question what went wrong in their case, and what could I do to avoid that particular criticism. Zedekiah did not have a historian in his court, but he did have a prophet, Prophet Jeremiah. The, it is said of the Prophet Jeremiah that he was the prophet of the Lord. So he was the voice of God right next to King Zedekiah the voice of God. So wherever and whenever Zedek uh, Jeremiah spoke, he would certainly have said, thus says the Lord. So he is the voice, he is the representative of God. So he could confidently depend on Jeremiah to give him the right interpretation of the past history. But it says that King Zedekiah did not listen to the prophet. In fact, it says King Zedekiah did not humble himself to listen to the prophet. Someone said, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat. In the passage that we, are, we have read, it is also said that the leaders of the nation, the priests, as well as the people, everyone went in the way that King Zedekiah had gone. And in that sense, if King Zedekiah was an illiterate, an ignorant king, the whole nation was ignorant and illiterate. So not only did Zedekiah go in the wrong way, he had led the whole nation astray. And it was perhaps easy for King Zedekiah to be the king of a nation of illiterates and ignorant, because he himself was an ignorant king an illiterate king. Literacy, in the sense of what we are talking here, means that we are able to look around our world, read the world, and make sense and meaning of what's going on around us. We keep our eyes open, we keep our ears open, and wherever necessary and whenever necessary, Except for our mouth, we keep our eyes and ears open. Sometimes it is best to keep our mouths, open, mouths closed. Ignorance and illiteracy, in the case of Zedekiah, fed each other and fed on each other. The lesson that comes to each one of us this morning, as we are deliberating on this question, what went wrong, is that we are shrewd enough to learn from our own experiences. We are shrewd enough to learn from the past. We are shrewd enough to look back and ask what went wrong and learn from our own mistakes and perhaps from others' mistakes as well. That is literacy enough. We are talking about the question what went wrong. First of all, I said the idea of ignorance, secondly, illiteracy, thirdly, the idea of intelligence, the lack of intelligence. Now, if you look at verse 13 in the passage that was read to us, it is said that King Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. 
What a foolishness. What a foolish thing to do. King Nebuchadnezzar was in history known as the destroyer. He was perhaps the most powerful king of his times. He had the most powerful army, the most well-trained army, the most ruthless and brutal king. And he wouldn't mind doing anything, anything to put down any rebellion. He will not mind doing that. Compared to the Babylonian Empire, compared to King Nebuchadnezzar, Zedekiah was no one. Judah was no comparison at all when it comes to Babylonian Empire. So it was actually utter foolishness and foolhardy to rebel against King Nebuchadnezzar. So he put himself, Zedekiah, into danger as well as the whole country to rebel against King Nebuchadnezzar was actually suicidal and foolishness, lack of intelligence. That is why you need a person like Prophet Jeremiah. If you happen to read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah every time tells the king to be careful, to go slow, to think, to rationalize, and to very carefully weigh the strengths and the power of King Nebuchadnezzar. Intelligence. Now, wisdom is to know one's own strengths as well as one's own weaknesses. Wisdom is to know the opponent's strengths, perhaps the weaknesses as well. Know your strengths. Zedekiah should have known his strengths. And even if he knows that he cannot stand up to King Nebuchadnezzar, that is wisdom enough. He would then have planned how to handle the situation. In our times, many have talked about what they call SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It is best that we sit together with people who matter to us and to whom we matter and take an objective look at our own selves and analyze carefully what our strengths are, weaknesses are, what are our opportunities, and what can be our threats. In that sense, King Zedekiah was his own enemy. King Zedekiah was his greatest, greatest enemy. Therefore, surround yourself with a group of people. He should have surrounded himself with diplomats, with political analysts, with thinkers, with critics. Whereas he surrounded himself with yes-men. We said the leaders of the nation, the priests and the people were simply yes-men. King, King Zedekiah had prophet Jeremiah. He could have listened to him. Only a great or pathologically insecure person will not listen to constructive criticisms. King Zedekiah had the prophet and he could have listened to him. Someone said, pen is mightier than sword. How true it is. If, even if Zedekiah was not a wise king in the sense of being able to write big, big uh, proverbs and writings such as um, the works of King Solomon, it doesn't really matter if he surrounded himself with good people. A wise man avoids conflict. A powerful man may be able to stand up to King Nebuchadnezzar, but a wise king can avoid conflict. We are still asking the question, what went wrong? Based on the passage that was read to us, we have looked at the idea of ignorance, illiteracy, lack of intelligence. Finally, the idea of missed opportunity. The idea of missed opportunity. <coughs> Zedekiah was the king. And uh, it is said that perhaps he became the king in 597 BCE, before the common era. And he was a king for 11 years 
up to until 586. Now, if you read verses 17 to 21 in the same chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 17 to 21, it talks about the Babylonian exile. He was king for 11 years, and he was also the last king. And he was the first one to be taken as the exile, as the captive. He had 11 years. If he was a wise king, he could have created a different history. He could have carved a different future for his own people and for, his, for himself. He could have averted the most, most painful, tragic event of the captivity and the exile. It's not necessary that history must end this way. The history of the ancient Israelites should have ended this way, that they should lose the nation, they should lose the land, they should lose their temple. Verses 17 to 21 give us a graphic picture of all that King Zedekiah had done. A king who lacked vision. A vision for himself, a vision for his people, and he didn't look beyond, look beyond his own times. How would history judge him? Now, if King Zedekiah ruled in 597 BCE, this is a, nearly, this is a 2,500 year old story. Now we are looking back in time and we are thinking that this is what had happened. How would history remember him? I am saying that he was perhaps the most foolish king. He was an illiterate king, an ignorant king. And what a tragedy that we have to remember him this way. In Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 7, it says that he lost his eyes. King Nebuchadnezzar pulled his eyes out. He was blinded. But before that, both his sons were killed right in front of his eyes. A man lacked vision. And what's the use of having two eyes without a vision? No story has to end in a tragedy. Even in our own lives, dear friends, we may have started our lives wherever. And we have come, but come so far. But we will decide how our story can end. We can decide how the last chapter of our own biography or autobiography can end. Our own history must end. Therefore, we can live intentionally today. It is said that Archimedes, the great Greek philosopher, thinker, and scientist said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. He said this in a completely different way. But we can say if Zedekiah took his place to stand, he could have moved the earth, or at least moved his nation, moved his history. No one gives you the place to stand. You have to take it. And if you decide to take your place to stand, nobody can stop it. What is the story that we can leave behind for the next generation? How would the next generation like to remember us? How would the next generation think of our story? We can leave a good story as our legacy for the next generation to recollect. King Zedekiah was, in fact, a wasted opportunity. King Zedekiah was the greatest tragedy in the history of his own nation. I would think he was a greater tragedy than the tragic exile itself. We can live in such a way that we can make a difference. What can you and I do to make a difference? Because we have a place to stand. Now, we have asked this question, what went wrong? Ignorance, illiteracy, intelligence, and 
missed opportunities. We are fortunate that we have this story to look back. And wisdom is to learn from others and avoid the pitfalls that we can notice. You may have heard this particular uh, titles of a book, The Seven Habits of Successful People. We don't have to read, we don't have to leave a bad memory, we don't have to become a negative paradigm. We can all become a positive paradigm, people who would want to follow. Finally, what went wrong? As I'm talking, there is a story in the New Testament that comes to my mind. In Luke chapter 15, you know the famous story, the story of the prodigal son. He goes to a faraway land, having taken his share of his father's property. And after squandering the wealth that he had, he becomes a pauper. He is now beginning to take care of the pigs that belonged to a person in that faraway land. Then he, it says, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, it is exactly the same way as we can say what went wrong. We are asking this question, what went wrong? That means when so-and-so had come to his senses. In the case of the prodigal son, when he asked that question, he went back to his father. So his whole future had changed when he asked this question, what was wrong with me? What did I go, what did I what did I do wrong? Where did I think wrong? So when he came to his senses, when he asked this question, what went wrong? Then he went back to his father and his future was completely different. In the New Testament, there is a word called metanoia, a changed thinking, a different way of looking at yourself and your world and the future. Metanoia, a changed mind. What went wrong has to do with the mind. How logically, rationally, we think in the present as well as looking deep into the future. May the Lord continue to give us this kind of wisdom, this kind of insight and discernment and insight into the future so that we can leave behind a beautiful story as our legacy. God bless us. Friends, we have heard God's word this morning. Let us respond to the word with the closing hymn for the healing of the nations.
Good morning once again. We've come to the almost to the end of the service this morning. Let me take you through the church news. We want to give thanks to God for those who are celebrating their birthdays this week and their wedding anniversaries. Please do remember to wish them and also to remember to pray for them. The next slide that you see is on the tithes and offerings. We have explained to you this before. These slides are for your information so that you may continue to give towards the ministry, towards the church through these three methods. Let us recite the memory verse for me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Let us now receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. Amen.